do appreciate you being back. And that song that we sang, To Christ Be Loyal and Be True, sadly, there are some who are not loyal and true to Christ. They begin the race, but they don't continue the race. They don't continue fighting the battles, and they allow Satan back into their hearts. When such takes place, God has commanded us to withdraw our fellowship from that individual. Uh, it is done, that action, by divine authority, not simply because someone is wanting to kick someone out of the church or they're wanting to get back at someone in some type of revenge or anything like that, but because God has commanded such to take place. There are at least 68 different verses relating to the subject of withdrawing a fellowship, specifying certainly a wide range of unrepented of sins in which the church is to deal with. We see that, and we generally classify these sins under about four different areas. That is doctrinal error, when someone teaches error that would cause individuals, if they believe it or to act accordingly, to be lost. Those who sow discord among brethren. Uh, the immoral individuals. And that, of course, covers a wide range of immoral acts and actions. And then, generally, just in an umbrella-type phrase, miscellaneous causes, that would be any public sin which a child of God will not repent. Those who walk disorderly, for example, uh, according to 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. And we also mentioned 1 John 1 and verse 9, that while God is light, if we say that we have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Well, that one who thus walks in darkness, and that is a general category uh, that would relate to anything and everything in relationship to our walking in darkness as opposed to walking in the light. It is certainly for the salvation of the soul of that individual to bring him out of his sin, to make him uh, stop the sins of the flesh, and thus for his eternal good and salvation. It's also good for the congregation, because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And so you do not want the sin of that individual affecting others, or to allow a congregation to think that sin will go uh, unrequited. It's important in relationship to the world because it allows the world to see where exactly we do stand. That we are going to be righteous in our living. We will not, that sin will not be tolerated. And it is an act of love for that individual in which we're withdrawing from because we're trying to save his soul. It is an act of soul saving. But... When, and I'm going to just title this part of this lesson, the timing of withdrawal. When do we withdraw from someone? Well, there are certain guidelines that should be followed. But we recognize that there are absolutely no guidelines really given in the Bible. But certain principles certainly do apply. There are certain guidelines in relationship to certain sins, but other sins, there's not. For example, in Matthew, the 18th chapter, Jesus is dealing here with sin, and if a brother sins against another brother, and he says, if thy brother tr shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that at the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. 
But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen and a man and a, and a publican. And thus we have for that situation a specific guideline that Jesus sets forth that we are to engage in. Here is a brother who commits a sin against another brother. This is not dealing with uh, people in the world. It's not dealing with public sin. It is dealing with one-on-one -on -one situation. And in that situation, the one who has been sinned against is to go to that one who has committed the sin and try to re restore that individual. Visit the sinner and urge, urge him to repent. If he hears it, then it's taken care of. No one else knows about it. It's over and done with. That sin is to be forgiven. But if he neglects to hear it, the one individual, then one who has been sinned against is to take one or two with him. Because at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word then may be established. And those two or three individuals then are to encourage that one who has committed the sin to repent. If he repents, then again, it goes no further. That sin is forgiven. No one else knows about it. But if he neglects to hear those, then you tell it to the church. Now then, you're bringing the entirety of the congregation of the Lord's church to bear upon that individual. Getting the entire congregation to do what they can to encourage that individual to repent. If he still refuses to repent, then there would be that action of withdrawal of fellowship. Here, as he puts it, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and as a publican. That's a specific guideline that God has given in relationship to one an individual who commits a sin against another individual. Far too often we do not go through that process though. We either get our dander up and we refuse to go to them. They, we sometimes put, they sinned against me, they are the ones who can make it right. Uh, instead of doing what we are supposed to do and going to that individual and trying to get him to repent. Or we go and tell other individuals and spread it around instead of just handling it on a one-on-one -on -one basis with the, with the specific individual. But while that deals with a specific situation in which Jesus is setting forth an individual sinning against another individual, do we not find some principles that are related in relationship to this entire subject? I think the principles are there even though not the specifics. That when there is someone who has committed sin, there should be visitation that takes place in trying to urge that sinner to repent. The reason that Jesus gave the specific instructions in Matthew 18 in relationship to one individual who has sinned against another individual, no one else knows about the sin. And so it should be handled on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Only when it cannot be handled on that one-on-one -on -one basis are others brought into the picture. And if it's still not handled, then the church as a whole is brought into the picture. That's that specific situation, but do we not see the principle of going to that brother who has committed sin, even if it is a public sin, to try to get him to repent? And a continued visitation, others possibly being involved in relationship to bringing that individual to repentance. And then there is the telling of the church. Why? To bring the entire church and the hopefully the pressure of the entire church upon that individual to repent, to make things right, to make him realize the value that he's going to lose and being withdrawn from. And if all 
efforts are fail, then that last step is to withdraw fellowship. Sometimes individuals want to are so gung ho in withdrawing fellowship that that's the first thing that they look at instead of the last thing, and that attitude would certainly be wrong. In Titus three and verse ten, we have another specific instruction in relationship to sin. When he says, a man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. The word heretic here, we generally refer to a heretic as one who is a false teacher. That's not what the meaning of the word is here. The word here is a factious individual. Someone who is causing divisions within the congregation. And he says, that individual... There's one admonition that is to be given. There's a second admonition that is to be given. And if they're still causing division, doing whatever it is to cause divisions within the congregation, then you reject him. That is the aspect of withdrawal of fellowship from the congregation. The congregation has to withdraw their fellowship for the protection of the congregation. But here, only one and a second admonition, and after that second admonition, if they're continuing in that factious behavior, the withdrawal of fellowship. And so, again, you have a specific guideline in relationship to a factious man, or one who causes division within the congregation. But again, there is admonitions that are taking place for that individual to repent. There is, though, an urgency that is needed in relationship to the withdrawal of fellowship. We see this principle set forth in Ecclesiastes 8 and verse 11. When the wise man says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. In other words, there needs to be a quick action in relationship to dealing with an evil work. Our judicial system, I think, saw the need for that early on. It's not, I don't think, so much taking place today. But they said a trial had to be within a quick time frame. You couldn't, uh, the prosecutor couldn't come back and after several years all of a sudden bring up a lawsuit. They had to be executed speedily. Now there's some that they avoided on that. In a case of murder, there's no time limit. But with other crimes, there are time limits that are given in order to make sure that the things are done in a quick manner. And then when he, in a criminal case, once an individual is going to be brought to trial, they have to do the trial very quickly unless, of course, there are delays that sometimes come up. And those delays many times nowadays take years and years to accomplish, it seems like. But they recognized in setting up our judicial system that things needed to be moving along quickly because they recognize the biblical principle that if you do not act speedily, as it puts it here, Solomon does, then the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. It encourages others to do evil if you delay action. If they're not going to do anything about this, then why not do that? And there's a, thus there's a principle that Solomon sets forth for us in taking care of things with a sense of urgency. The longer that sin is allowed to fester in a congregation, the more damage it's going to do. I mean, we just, it, it's very simple. One bad apple in a bushel of apples is going to ruin all of the apples. Um, in relationship to that, in, that sinner, the longer that sin is allowed to remain in his heart, 
the more difficult it's going to be for that individual to repent. As he is committing sin within his life, he is searing over his heart. And to break through that hardened heart that has caused him to engage in sinful actions is going to become harder and harder and harder the more we wait, the more we delay. But also that individual might die in his sins. If he does, that individual is lost. Or he might even become mentally incapable of responding in a proper way. Those things do take place as we get older. Also, more people are going to be affected by his sin. If it's taken care of quickly, fewer people. If you wait and delay, more and more people are going to be affected by his sin. And of course, another reason to take care of it speedily is because the Lord might come. We don't know when the Lord's going to come. He might come before the close of this service. He might delay another thousand years. Who knows? We don't. But he could come before we start engaging in the action of trying to get that individual to repent. What a sad situation that becomes then for that individual who's going to be lost because we did not act properly. We delayed doing what we needed to do. I think it's interesting when you go to 1 Corinthians 5th chapter and you look at this situation. Because here you have this man. He's taken his stepmother, in effect, uh, his father's wife. But the, the wording indicates it is his stepmother. Such sin is not even named among the Gentiles. They were puffed up about it, he says. Verse 2, you're puffed up and have not rather mourned that he which hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Now what's he talking about when he says taken away from among you? He's talking about withdrawal of fellowship from that individual. And he says you're unconcerned with it. That's the idea of puffed up. You don't, you're not concerned about it. You should have been mourning over this sin, but you're, you don't care. That's the attitude that you have taken in regards to this sin. You don't care. Well, you should care. You should care for his soul. You should care for the souls of others that it's going to infiltrate. You should be caring. That would cause you to put away that individual from among yourself but you did not take action. But when we come down to verse 4 and verse 5, there's an interesting aspect as to the timing of this that Paul is telling them to do to take this individual away from yourselves. And he says, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit and with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Here he is saying, in effect, the very next time you meet, you withdraw from that individual. That's the idea that he is presenting. You do this immediately. There's no question about his sin. There's no question about the ungodliness of it. Everyone, including that man, knows that it is sin. Thus, it needs to be taken care of, and it needs to be taken care of immediately, without delay. There's that sense of urgency that Paul is setting forth for this Corinthian, the Corinthian brethren instead of their action of unconcern about it and not doing anything about it. He says, very next time you meet, you withdraw from that individual. That's how serious a matter this is. You do not want the sin to infiltrate the congregation. You don't want the sin to cause 
those in the world to look at the church in a derogatory way. And certainly in the sin, in the sin that, that they were dealing with, that is the case. Because he says, even the Gentiles think this is wrong. Thus, this is such an ungodly sin that everyone knows about it and knows that it's wrong. And they are seeing the church and that individual in that congregation and nothing is being done about it. And as a result, it's bringing reproach upon the name of the Lord. You need to take care of this immediately. Without delay. And so, look at verse 7. Again, you see the urgency. When he says, purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as you are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover sacrificed for us. Purge him out. Don't delay. Don't let him cause more sin to come within the congregation. You get him out. And so there are sins that need to be taken care of immediately without delay. And yet, even with that sense of immediacy, there should always be that sense of trying to restore that individual. In Galatians, the sixth chapter, the very first verse says, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering this thyself, lest thou also be tempted. There must be, yes, that sense of urgency, but also within that sense of urgency, there needs to be that sense of res restoration to that individual. And yes, when there are sins of such a nature that everyone recognizes the wickedness of them and the sin of it and he is involved in it and everyone knows it, there needs to be an urgency even faster than you know, private sins where we saw Matthew 18 and, uh, or 15, 18 through 17 that you go to him, then take one or two, then tell it to the church, then you withdraw from it. See, 1 Corinthians 5 doesn't deal with that type of procedure. He says, when you're gathered together, do it. Different sins, there's different responses. And yet all of them with a sense of urgency because we want that individual to repent and come back to the truth. There's that sense of restoration in however it is dealt with. James, the fifth chapter, verse 19 and verse 20, also says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Yes, you convert him from the error of his way. And this is a great passage in relationship to the false doctrine of once saved, always saved. Brethren, who's he talking to? He's talking to Christians now. If any of you do what? You err. That's going astray. You can't go astray unless you've been there. You err from the truth. What needs to be done? He needs to be converted. When you convert that individual, what do you do? Well, you hide, a save a soul from death. Wait a minute, I thought he was a Christian. If once saved, always saved is true, he could not be in danger of death. His soul could not be. But he says, here's this brother who you're saving from death. Hiding a multitude of sins. What is it? There's that brother who is engaged in sin. What needs to be done? There needs to be a converting of that individual. And again, let me emphasize that, yes, there is an aspect of urgency. 
but each situation is dealt with differently. Even as we see, here's an individual who sins another, against another individual in the procedure that is to be taking place. One who is a factious individual or heretic of Titus 3 and 10. Another procedure is to take place. This individual and fornicator in, first, in Corinth immediately, without any, well, prior procedure taking place, but immediately withdrawing fellowship from. Now, we see differences as far as the approach as to the ending result of withdrawing a fellowship based upon, yes, the sin that is involved in it, but also we would see in relationship to the individuals. That individual who is rebellious, you're going to deal with that individual in one way. An individual who simply has a lack of knowledge and understanding, you're going to deal with that individual a different way. You who have had children, don't you know you deal with everything in a different way? And sometimes you deal with them very harshly, especially if they become rebellious. And if they are rebellious, uh, then that's going to be a pretty severe punishment. However, if they're just learning and they're trying to learn and trying to do what's right, aren't you going to be patient and long-suffering with them? That's the same way that congregations deal with individuals and elderships must deal with individuals. Not everyone is to be immediately withdrawn from. That would be wrong of an eldership to do such. It would be wrong of an eldership to think of withdrawal of fellowship as first action. No, that would be wrong. Instead, you look at the individual, you look at the sin that he is involved in, and you consider all of these facts in relationship to your working with that, that individual. And then, when I look at this also, I look at God and his dealings with Israel. I've got to admit, I, there's no way that I would have been as patient as God was with Israel. I, I just wouldn't. Would you? I mean, you look at the 1,500-year history of Israel, would you have been as patient and long-suffering with them as God? I, said, I wouldn't. I would have destroyed them long before God did. Uh, and they deserved it. But what does Peter tell us about that in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9? That God is long suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When you're working with someone, or an eldership in the area of withdrawal of fellowship is working with someone and trying to get that individual to repent, if that individual is studying and continuing and you're able to work with that individual, and even though the progress might be slow, you continue to work with that individual. On the other hand, another individual who is rebellious and he's not going to repent. I don't care what you do. Yes, we've seen the individuals who are like that. You go ahead and do what you've got to do. I don't care. Well, there's no use in continuing to be patient with that individual. He's, he's so, shown what he's going to do and how he's going to act. He's shown that he's not going to become repentant. He's not going to follow after God's will. And so you deal with that individual in the manner in which he has responded. On the other hand, that individual who is, you're working with him and there's progress being made, you can be slow and patient and long-suffering with that individual. That's how elders have to consider every situation that they deal with. And no two situations are ever going to be the same. I know that I've been asked several times, how would you deal with such and such? Well, I don't know. Because every situation is different. 
How would you respond to this? I don't know. Because every situation is different. One of those favorite ones that we get asked. How would you deal with someone who said, well, y'all, are th y'all think you're the only ones going to heaven? I don't know how I would respond because I don't know the individual that's asking the question at the time. What's his attitude? Is he asking because that's something that he's heard about us and he's wanting to an honest inquiry? Or is that someone who's trying to be flippant about the whole situation and say, well, I'm not, there's no way I'm going to be a part of you. I don't care. What's the attitude of the individual? It's going, the response is going to be different based upon the individual. That's what we're saying in relationship to withdrawing a fellowship. And working with an individual, yes, there needs to be a sense of urgency. But in that sense of urgency, there also has to be patience that is demonstrated toward an individual as he is growing and developing in Christ. I think sometimes we do a great deal of damage in the Lord's church by jumping on people thinking they should know something when many times they don't. You remember what I mentioned this morning from first uh, from John, uh, the 16th chapter, when Jesus had spent three and a half years with his apostles, and he says, there's things that I can't tell you now because you're not able to bear it. He was the master teacher, and yet, spending three and a half years with these men, and there were still things that they could not bear. And so he couldn't tell them. That should tell us something in relationship to the growth of individuals. That sometimes individuals are going to grow at different rates, different paces. Some individuals, they will grow very fast, very quickly in the spiritual matters. Others, not so. Sometimes we jump on those, you ought to know better. Well, maybe not. Maybe they haven't developed to that point where they should have. And they need extra teaching instead of condemnation. We need to be careful in relationship to how we deal with, many, with individuals. Uh, can't say that I do this all the time from a personal standpoint, but what we should do is we continue and be willing to work with that individual until he shows us a rebellious aspect. Now, he's not going to accept the truth. It doesn't matter what you say or what you do. Then you deal with that individual in a far different manner. And yes, there's both kinds. So there does need to be that urgency that is there, though. We should not put off withdrawing fellowship from somebody for years and years and years. And sadly, within the church of our Lord today, those who practice withdrawal of fellowship, generally about the only ones they withdraw from are those individuals who quit attending worship services and they quit a few years ago and so now then, well, I guess they're not coming back, so let's withdraw from them. We need to do something. And the effect of that is lost because we did not deal with it immediately. If it had been dealt with the first time they missed, the second time they missed, could that an individual have been saved and won back to Christ? That's the urgency that is involved because we are in the soul-saving business and that which we do must be directed toward the saving of souls. And withdrawal of fellowship, yes, that is an effort to, withdraw, to save the soul of that individual. And when we allow it to continue on and that individual to continue on in his sin to such an extent that his heart is seared over and hardened to such an extent that nothing could ever be done to save that individual, then we've done that in individual an injustice. 
when it should have been taken care of early on, when maybe the heart was still pliable and able to be touched. There's the urgency that's involved. But as said, we are in that soul-saving business. That's the purpose of the church, to, to be, get people to heaven. That, at a, uh, well, evangelism, Evangelism is to save souls. The edification that is, takes place is to save souls. Benevolence, yes, that aspect of the church, work of the church, it is ultimately to save souls. That's the work of the church. Now, if you're not in that saved state this afternoon, then why not repent of your sin? Do that which God wants you to do, to have eternal life. Lay hold of eternal life. Grab hold of it. Never let it go. It becomes the most important thing within your life, the salvation of your soul. Let nothing interfere with it. If you've not obeyed the gospel, then that's what's necessary to lay hold on eternal life. If you've become a Christian, but you have fallen back, you've erred from the truth, as we read in James 5 and verse 19, then why not be converted back to the truth? Save your soul from death. Hide those multitude of sins by repenting of your sin, letting us pray with you for the forgiveness of it. You need to come this evening, afternoon, then why not do so as we stand and sing the invitation song?